Good evening and thank you for watching. Given the choice between wisdom and wealth, which one do you think most people would choose? See, I think people would choose the money. We live in a culture that would rather be rich than smart. Don't you agree? Now Solomon is a guy who's both rich and smart. And the book of Ecclesiastes is his critique, if you will, of the secular life. The life where riches and education are highly valued. Solomon had the means and the intelligence to give anything and everything a try, and he did. And his report on what he discovered is the book of Ecclesiastes. And in our reading for today, particularly in chapter 5, Solomon wants to talk about wealth. Look at chapter 5, beginning in verse 10. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. I've seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there's nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from his mother's womb, and everyone comes, and then they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This, too, is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain? since they toil for the wind. All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. This is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Our culture says that the quality of life depends on the quantity of our investments. He who dies with the most toys wins. Even in churches, preachers preach the health and wealth gospel that says, if you'll just follow Jesus Christ and claim by faith his provision, God will see to it that you will be financially set, that you will be physically blessed because God's in the business of prospering you. God wants you to be rich. And you know what? That gospel sells in the United States of America, but it won't sell in Malawi where the average income is 400 bucks a person. Now, any gospel that isn't for everybody everywhere is a false gospel. And folks, true disciples of Jesus Christ understand that he has called us to a life of self-denial. He has called us to carry a cross, not a suitcase full of cash. Nowhere in Scripture does Jesus ever say, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have pocketfuls of money. No, Jesus says, Watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed, because life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Solomon doesn't see any connection at all between abundant wealth and abundant life. Instead, he says just the opposite, that often much money can bring much misery. And in the text that we just read, Solomon gives us four really good reasons why money doesn't buy happiness. Number one, Solomon says that people are never satisfied with how much money they have. Verse 10, again, says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. You know, people who are stranded out in the ocean find out that you can't satisfy your thirst by drinking ocean water, salt water, because all that water does is make you thirstier. 
Same way with money. We always yearn for more than we earn. And if we look to money to give us the meaning that we'd so desire in life, we're not ever going to be satisfied. We will always wish that we had more. Secondly, Solomon reminds us that money tends to leave in a hurry. It flies away like it has wings. We have a saying that says a fool and his money are soon parted. And I think that's right. My mama puts it this way. He spends money like it's burning a hole in his pocket. Wealth evaporates. Think about the crash of 2008, the last year that George W. Bush was president. It taught us that you cannot count on your wealth being there. I remember that year my 401k became a 201k. And I hope we understand that God can take our money away from us anytime he wants to. After all, it's his money. Hyperinflation in our culture today is already starting to rob us of money. The value of a dollar seems to be falling by the minute. And when our government decides that America needs more money, what do they do? Well, they just go print it up like monopoly money. At what point does that money become worthless? Money can leave in a hurry. Solomon also says that money attracts fake friends. Verse 11 in the New Living Translation says, The more you have, the more people will come to help you spend it. The message in that verse says, The more loot you get, the more looters show up. People who have money are always living with the thought, Do I have a lot of friends because they like me or because they like my money? And then there's the biggest downside to wealth, according to Solomon, and that is that money makes us anxious. Verse 12 of the text, let me read it again, says, The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat just a little or they eat a lot. But for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. You know, America is the richest country on earth, and yet five of the ten best-selling medications are for anxiety. Jesus says materialism is the mother of anxiety. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you know why you worry so much? It's because you're obsessed by what you're going to wear and what you're going to eat and where you're going to live. And then he said, if you'll be that obsessed with the kingdom of God, you won't have any worries. Solomon and Jesus both contend that whoever told us that money makes us happy is the world's biggest liar. Because all it does is make us want more, make us sleep less, and make us question the sincerity of our friends. Folks, a pocketbook full of money will not give us purpose in our lives. And isn't that what we really want? To have purpose? A reason for being? And then, of course, the last thing that Solomon points out is old death. Verses 15 and 16 say, Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they will depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This, too, is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart, and what do they gain since they toil for the wind? See, it doesn't matter how good the security system is down at your bank or how well your safe is bolted to the foundation of your house. It doesn't matter how deep you've buried the Folgers coffee can in the backyard that's full of cash. You can't protect yourself from the thief known as death. We're all going to die. So why be occupied with stuff that in an instant is worthless to you. Paul says this, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7, we brought nothing into the world and we will take nothing out of it. Folks, everything in this world is temporary. And when we stand before God on that great day, the things that matter will not be things. Proverbs 11, verse 4 says, wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. In other words, right living may not make you financially wealthy, 
but it could make you spiritually rich. And so the best thing you and I can do today is to simplify our lives and invest in the things that are truly valuable, like the relationship we have with God, like the relationships we have with people, especially family members and church members. Simplify and love. Nobody lived that lifestyle like Jesus did. He's the great example. And so like Jesus, may we be people who are rich in wisdom as we enjoy the rich blessing of knowing God. And let's use our blessings to be a blessing to others. That's a whole lot more satisfying than spending everything on ourselves. Have a great week, and God bless.